Hi everybody, this is Davis again from Hardin County Conservation. Today, since everybody's still stuck at home, we actually figured we would do a short story for some of the kiddos that are stuck at home or they might be at uh, daycare or, or just at home in general. So since we're getting warmer, today is supposed to be above 70 degrees. It's super nice outside. We figured we would talk about some aquatic wildlife. So we're gonna do our presentation in front of our big 300 gallon aquarium behind me with all the really neat fish in it. So you can watch that as we are talking here. But our topic of the day is actually going to be river otters. So for those that don't know a lot about river otters, we actually do have North American river otters right here in Hardin County. And at one point, not too long ago, uh, river otters were almost extirpated from the state of Iowa, which means we almost did not have any of them left. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Trapping was a, a major reason. Otter furs sold for a lot of money and they were a, a pretty high commodity. And then the other thing that really contributed to their, their degradation in our native ecosystems were habitat declines, so just general habitat loss. But thanks to the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and other conservation organizations, we actually reintroduced otters to the state of Iowa and we now have thriving populations pretty much statewide. So they are very cool critters. We're gonna talk a lot about their special adaptations today. I have some pieces of otters that I'm gonna show you. I have a skin, skull, we'll talk about the fish in the tank behind me here a little bit since it pertains to otters. So stay tuned with us here. But we are gonna read a short story to go with our otter stuff today and it's called River Otter at Autumn Lane. This is probably one that you guys can pick up from your local library or even from Amazon. So if you wanna keep it in your personal collection, you can definitely do that too. Otherwise, you can just watch our short story. All right, let's get started here. After a long snowy winter in Vermont, spring has finally arrived. Behind an old white farmhouse on Autumn Lane runs a lazy stretch of river. At the river's edge, in a den between the roots of fallen trees, a river otter is nursing her three newborn cubs. So next to our fallen tree here, we have Mama River Otter and her cubs. River Otter's cubs are tiny, blind, and helpless. After only a few moments of suckling, they fall fast asleep. Before the cubs were born, River Otter worked hard to make a cozy nest for them. She carried bunches of dried leaves in her mouth, bringing them through a tangle of tree roots hiding the entrance to a tunnel. The tunnel once led to a beaver's den. Now, River Otter has made the empty den her home. Here she is in her den with her leaves and her babies. River Otter is hungry. She leaves her sleeping cubs to find food. Another tunnel at the other end of the den leads her directly into the river. On her belly, River Otter slides smoothly through the tunnel and into the water. She dives straight to the bottom to look for her favorite meal, crayfish. So here she is coming out of her den and she's sliding down into the water to look for crayfish or crawdads or crawfish you might have heard them call. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually track river otters because in that picture, I'll show you again, of the river otter coming out of the mud bank here. That actually relates a lot to how we track our river otters in Hardin County. So river otters, they like to make their dens in mud banks if they're going to make their own den just because it's softer soil, easier to dig into. So they'll make their dens in those big cut banks that we have along our rivers. One way we can actually tell if that den is occupied is by that slide mark that the otter makes. So the way that she was sliding out of her den here, what happens is, let's say we have an opening here. If the otter comes out and she slides down that mud bank, she's actually gonna leave a trail with her stomach and it'll just be kind of a smooth, slick mark that'll go right down all the way to the water. So we look for those, we call them slide marks or slides. Uh, you can even see the same thing with like crocodiles, alligators, things like that. So slides tell us a lot about if that den is occupied or if it has been recently used. A couple of other things that you will find. Uh, when an otter walks around, if, let's say if they're gonna walk back up into the den, you will actually find footprints close to the, the den opening there. And their footprints are a bit unusual. They don't look like a lot of other uh, mammals in the area in particular. When they make an impression in the ground, since they are semi-aquatic, they actually have webbed feet. So when they push into the mud, they actually leave a webbing impression. And you can't see it much on their feet here, but I will show you on the skin a little bit. So if you look there, otter foot is pretty small. 
Uh, and there is webbing there, it's just really super hard to see. You can kind of see it, it's gonna be in between the toes here, but that, that webbing is just like what you would see on an animal like a duck or other species of waterfowl, or you can see it in beavers. So any animal that's gonna be semi-aquatic or fully aquatic that's got that webbing, if they leave a track on the ground, they're gonna leave that webbed impression. So we look for those tracks. If we wanna know if there's more than one individual that's living in that den, so just like in our story, if we have uh, a mama otter with a bunch of cubs, you'll actually see different size tracks. So mom's tracks will be a lot bigger, baby's tracks will be a lot smaller. So we do look for individual track sets to actually be able to identify how many individuals we might have in a particular den. The other thing we can look at when we track otters is actually their scat or their poop. So when they go to the bathroom because of what they eat, they'll eat fish like the suckers and the shiners and the creek chubs in the tank behind me. When they eat those, they can't digest the scales on the fish. So when they go to the bathroom, the scales of the fish actually show up in their poop. The other things you will see in there, is, let's say if they crushed a piece of mussel shell and uh, they actually have little fragments from that mussel shell, you might find fragments of the shell inside their poop. The other thing you will find, in our story we read that they one of their favorite food sources are crayfish, which we have tons of here in the river. We have lots of crayfish products. Uh, you actually find broken pieces of their shells or their exoskeletons. So those are the things we look for when we want to be able to track otters. This is something that you guys can do even in your time of quarantine. You can go poke around the river and look for slides and tracks and all sorts of cool stuff at, at local parks. So we'll get a little more into our story here and we'll talk a little bit more about otters as we keep going along. River otter pokes her nose into cracks and under rocks. Her stiff whiskers feel around for food. Under a large rock, her whiskers detect a movement. It is a crayfish. River otter digs under the rock with her nose and grabs the crayfish in her mouth. She carries her tasty meal to the water's surface and eats it. So let's talk a little bit about how they actually eat. So it's said that they bring their food to the surface. That is definitely true, it's easier for them to manage. They'll push bait fish up to the surface, they'll take crayfish to the surface. If they have a big fish, like the sucker that's right here that's swimming in the tank behind me, normally they will actually take it to shore so they can get it better under control. They'll kind of use their claws and their feet to pin their food down and they can, they can sit there and eat. But to actually be able to catch this stuff, they're not gonna catch it with their hands in the water. What they're gonna use is their mouth. And I'm gonna show you the jaw here and you're gonna see why they are such effective predators in the water. So if we look at a skull here on our North American river otter, look at those teeth there. So we have these large canine teeth. So just like you guys have your little fangs right here. Uh, these canine teeth are meant to puncture food and they hold on. So once they are pierced, they've pierced that fish or that crawdad or whatever they're gonna eat. Once it's pierced, they can hold on to it. What the teeth in the back are for is once they have their prey killed and they have them under control, they will actually crush their food with those teeth there. So even though they are somewhat sharp, those are definitely their crushing teeth. These are their puncture teeth. And then just like we have, if you look at their little front teeth here, they have incisors a lot like people do. So they use their incisors similar to how we do as well. We'll talk about their eyesight and the rest of the skull here in just a little bit, but very effective predators and those teeth are very beneficial for them being able to actually catch their food. Uh, we did talk about whiskers a little bit too. I do have an otter skin here, but it unfortunately does not have any whiskers on it because it's kind of old. Uh, but the whiskers that come off the nose here can actually be about this long, so I'd say about three inches or so. And they use them just like a catfish or a carp would, where they would take those whiskers and they feel around on the, the substrate and the rocks and things that are, that are in the bottom of the water column or sitting on the, the sediment line. And they can actually feel with those whiskers uh, to help them detect movement and vibration and things that crayfish or uh, small fish might make that are tucked up underneath some of those rocks that make it difficult for them to find food. So that is one of the many features, those whiskers that, that help them to actually find the food. And the other thing we're gonna talk about is their eyesight. So we'll talk about eyesight here in just a little bit, but we'll get back to our story. So here's our otter again. She's found her crayfish and she's gonna bring him up to the surface and make a meal out of him, I think. On her belly, River Otter glides for a moment, now and then pushing the water with one foot. She then tucks her webbed feet closer to her stomach and dives to the bottom, rippling her body as she swims. She eats several more crayfish until her appetite is satisfied. River Otter climbs out of the water and onto the riverbank. So here she is getting done with her hunt. <clears throat> 
River Otter doesn't swim far from her den. She wants to be within hearing distance of her cubs. She waddles through the huge black willow trees on her short, stubby legs. She looks awkward and clumsy, but River Otter is strong and fast. She stops and rubs herself dry against a cluster of honeysuckle before returning to her cub. So here she is rubbing that little honeysuckle bush. Let's talk about the hair just a little bit. Otters are very well insulated. They can actually swim in the water even in the winter time uh, when the rivers are frozen. They'll keep a spot open where they can go in and hunt. But this hair is very, very unique on otters. It's really short. It almost looks like they have somewhat of a buzz cut. And the reason for that is they want to have short hair so that they can actually propel themselves through the water a lot faster. So they keep that short, slick hair. There's actually kind of an oily sheen on the outside there that keeps that hair relatively waterproof and well insulated when they're swimming, especially in cold water. But once this otter gets wet, the issue it has when it gets out of the water, it still stays wet. So in order to keep their insulation and to keep themselves warm once they get out of the water, they need to dry themselves off. So in our story, it said they, they rub against maybe a honeysuckle bush. Other things they will do, they will actually rub in uh, dirt wallows or um, dry piles of leaves, things like that, to actually take all that extra water, that excess water off of their coat. So the coat is very important for them to be able to swim fast, but it's also very important uh, for them to be able to keep themselves warm. So they take really good care of their coats, just like we take care of our hair. So very, very simple. We'll get back to our story here. By early July, the days are warm and long. Fields of tall grass feed the flocks of sheep and the cows behind the old white farmhouse. River Otter's cubs had spent the last three months in their den, eating, sleeping, and growing. They're almost twice as big as they were at birth and they can now see and hear. So it looks like our little otters have finally woken up and they're gonna start to explore here soon. River Otter plays with her cubs often. She rolls around in a ball with them. She gives them rides on her back. When River Otter takes short trips to get food, the cubs continue to play in the den, wrestling and tumbling with each other. So otters are very social animals. They're very playful. Otters are also very curious. If they see a person or maybe something they haven't seen on the river before, they will approach it. One thing I do always recommend to people, you have to remember, even though otters are cute and they look like they're a lot of fun and they love to play, they can be very dangerous sometimes. Uh, they are actually related to weasels, uh, such as uh, species of mink, ermine, least weasels, but they're also related to animals like badgers. So they're in the mustelid family and they can be very dangerous, uh, especially if it's a wild individual. So anytime you see them on the river, we always recommend never approach a wild animal, never touch a wild animal. Keep your distance, take pictures, feel free to watch that animal, but never ever approach that animal because they can be very, very dangerous, especially when you looked at those teeth beforehand. Uh, if you were to have an encounter with those teeth, that would be a bad deal. So definitely keep your distance, uh, even though they are cute and fuzzy and fun and very playful. The cubs have not, let, yet the, have not left the den yet, but river otters know the time has come for them to explore their world. She leads them out of the den to the river's edge. The cubs stagger behind her. Their legs are still a bit weak and wobbly. They tumble and trip and finally gain their balance. So here they are getting ready to head to the river. River Otter slides down a muddy slope and lands with a splash in the river. She swims a short distance and then chirps and squeaks, calling her babies into the water. The cubs look on, terrified. They do not want to go in the cool, dark river. So there are the cubs up on the riverbank, and down below we have Mom in the water. So they're a little hesitant at first, and I think that might change here. River Otter chirps and squeaks again. Still, the cubs don't budge. River Otter swims to the surface and climbs up the riverbank. With her nose, she nudges each cub toward the water. The cubs simply cannot be coaxed into a swimming lesson. So they're still up there, they're still a little hesitant. Finally, River Otter has no choice but to pick up the cubs by the scruffs of their necks and drag them to the water, popping them in one by one. At first, the cubs just bob up and down. One cub tries to scramble up the riverbank, but River Otter drags him back into the water. The mom is forcing them to go for a swim. She's teaching them how to swim. After a few days, River Otter's cubs are at home in the river. They watch their mother as she dives for crayfish and mud minnows. They watch her catch eels and frogs. The cubs don't catch their own food right away. River Otter brings food to the shore for them to eat. 
But very soon, River Otter will teach them how to dive and catch food for themselves. So some other things we're gonna talk about quickly to kind of end our story here are some of the adaptations that otters have to help them find food better still, uh, or to help them more so when they're swimming in the water. So we have a couple things. First one we'll talk about, so here's our full otter skin, just so you can see it. But we wanna talk about the back half here. So this is gonna be the otter's tail. And their tail is quite long for an animal their size, but this tail has kind of a special use for uh, this otter. So let's say they were encounter something like a sucker or a larger fish, uh, like what's in the tank behind me. What they use this tail for is if that fish is gonna swim really fast and it's gonna be really darty, like many of our larger fish are, they can actually use this tail, just like a rudder, to actually twist and actually change direction really, really fast. So they can use that tail to, to rapidly change which way they are going, uh, but it's a very important piece nonetheless. It helps them to be very agile when they're in the water. A Couple other things we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna focus on the head here a little bit. When you look at the head, you really don't notice a whole lot. You can't see the eyes, you can't see the ears, you can see the nose here on the end but I'll show you, I'm gonna put my thumb up right here. There is an eye slit. So their eyes are fairly large, just compared to the rest of the head. They're not super teeny tiny. Their eyes are actually very good and very helpful in the water. So those eyes have a special membrane that flips down. We call it a nictitating membrane. It's kind of like a third eyelid for that critter there. And what they do with that is they flip it down and actually works kind of like a pair of goggles where they can see better in the water once that eyelid is flipped down. So it keeps the water off of their their eyelids. Uh, animals like crocodiles have it, alligators have it. There's all sorts of aquatic critters that, that use that to be able to see better in the water. So that helps them to find their prey better. So the eyes in addition to the whiskers. Nose is obviously gonna help them smell their food. But one thing you will notice here, and this is a bit of an unusual one, is you really can't see the ears at all. And I will show you where the ears are at. I have one right here on my pointer finger and another one right here. So right across from each other. And the reason those ears are so small, they don't use their ears a lot to actually be able to find their prey, but they do need them still to be able to hear their cubs and uh, be able to hear out of the water, maybe even hear for predators, things that might approach them in the wild. But the reason for the teeny tiny ears and the really slick head profile, so it's long and kind of V-shaped, is to essentially work like a swimmer's cap. So if you guys have ever uh, seen people in a swimming pool or, or seen Olympic swimmers before, they put that swim cap on their head. And the reason for that is it keeps them more streamlined when they go through the water. So let's say I were to jump in the water and I had super long hair and my ears stick out really far. I'm gonna be a lot slower in the water than say somebody who's got a swim cap on and who's got all their facial hair cut off and who has a buzz cut. Um, it just helps you to go faster through the water. So that is the reason the otter has kind of that real sleek profile in the head. So you'll notice it's very, very slim, and that is very crucial to them being able to hunt. Now I will show you on the skull here too, just a little bit with the eyes. We didn't get to see the eyes very well earlier. Here are the two spots where the eyes go. So their eyes are somewhat forward facing. They're, on, they're towards the front of the face for sure, but they are actually positioned kind of up and angled on the head a little bit. And the reason for that is because it's kind of the, the best position for them to be able to find different prey items that are, that are swimming throughout the water. So if there's something that swims past them this way or something that swims past them this way, that eye positioning on the head is gonna help them to see a lot better than say, if their eyes were totally on the front of their head, because if it's on the front of their head, they can really only see what's in front of them. If it's clear back on the sides, they're not gonna be able to see what's directly in front of them. So that positioning that's kind of up and forward on the head is gonna help them to be able to see everything around them really, really super well. So that eyesight is crucial for the otters to be able to hunt well. So here we have our baby otters swimming, if I didn't show you that earlier. And our last page to close off our story here. Three months pass and autumn arrives. River Otter has taught her cubs how to be skillful swimmers and divers. In the spring, River Otter's cubs will be ready to live on their own and River Otter will give birth to another litter of cubs. But for now, River Otter and her family will spend much of the fall and winter together in the den by the lazy stretch of river behind the old white farmhouse on Autumn Lane. So there's our family of River Otters. We have another one that's sitting over here. And that is the end of our story. So that was River Otter on Autumn Lane. 
Uh, if you would like to have this at home, you guys can actually buy this probably on Amazon or you can pick it up from a library somewhere, I'm sure. But it's only $16 if you do buy it. So if you want a fun story for home, that is a great one that's put out by the Smithsonian Institution. We use those a lot for our public programs, especially with younger kids. So great resource there. Uh, if you do have any questions about otters or uh, anything pertaining to aquatic wildlife here in Hardin County or around the Iowa Falls area, definitely give us a shout. You can leave comments below if you have any questions for us, uh, any comments, and we look forward to your feedback. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we hope you get out of social isolation soon. So thank you.